I found this tart pan at a resale shop and I know it's a pretty large container for a candle, but I love the shape. So I just need to figure out how many wicks to use to make sure that it burns evenly. As long as you have a heat safe container, you can make a candle out of almost anything. The hard part is figuring out how many wicks to use and where to put them. What I've started doing is using a paper circle method that shows me exactly how many wicks I need to use and where to place them. And I'm going to show you guys how I do that in this video. Let's figure out how much wax to add to this container. The easy way to find this out is by measuring how much water it takes to fill the container almost all the way to the top. It took 16 ounces of water, so I'm going to use 16 ounces of wax. And I know that wax is slightly less dense than water, so technically I need a little less than 16 ounces of wax, but I like having some extra just in case I spill. I'm using a blend of soy wax and beeswax, and I'll explain why I'm doing that in just a second. You can use whatever wax blend you like. If you're making a container candle, I'd suggest using 100% soy wax so that you don't have to buy two different types of wax. A general rule that I follow is if I'm making a candle that needs to stand up on its own, I'll use a harder wax like beeswax. If I'm making a candle that is contained within something else, I'll go for a softer wax like soy. The reason I'm throwing a little bit of beeswax in this candle is because this is going to be a citronella candle that will live outdoors in the heat. So I want it to be a little harder to melt. Beeswax has a higher melting point, so this blend is going to be more heat resistant than a 100% soy wax candle. I'm also adding a powder called stearic acid. It makes the wax harder and more opaque. This ingredient is optional. You'll still get a great candle even if you don't use it, but if you really like candle making, I'd suggest doing a quick search for candle additives like stearic acid because they can really help with the appearance of the candle and with the quality of the burn. The final ingredient is the fragrance oil, but we're not going to add it yet. We need to add it to melted wax at the right temperature. This candle looks nice, but four wicks is not enough, so it's not actually going to burn evenly. If you have too many wicks, you'll create a potential fire hazard. If you don't have enough wicks, the candle will never melt all the way to the edge. The wicks will just burn little tunnels into the wax and you won't actually get to use the whole candle. Choosing the right number is all about the size of the melt pool. This is a melt pool. The heat from the flame creates a pool of melted wax around the wick, and if you use a larger wick, you'll get a larger melt pool. As you make bigger candles, you'll either want to increase the size of the wick you're using or increase the number of wicks you use throughout the candle. You can either find the size of the melt pool on the packaging that comes with the wick, or you can test it yourself. I measured the melt pool after making this four wick candle so that I could trace it onto a sheet of paper. Once I know the diameter of the melt pool, I can cut circles out of paper to visualize how many wicks I need to use and where I need to place them. I already know that four wicks is not enough for this container based on the burn test that I just showed you. Adding a fifth is still not enough to cover the entire surface, so I'm going to need to add more wicks. It looks like seven is the right number of wicks for this candle. The only way to know for sure is to test it out. So I'm going to show you a burn test with the seven wick candle when I'm done making it. But first, I'm going to show you how I set up the wicks. To find the center of this circle, I fold it in half and then I fold it in half again a second time. The two creases I just made cross in the center. And if I make a couple of small cuts here, I now have a hole that I can slip the wick through. Now I can use the paper circles to place the wicks so that I don't actually have to measure the container and mark off each spot. The only spot I have to mark is the center of the candle so that I have a starting point. Remove the paper backing, press the metal tab onto the sticker, peel it off of the sheet, and then press it into place. Now I can set up the other six using the paper circles to visualize where the melt pool will go. I like this method so much better than having to measure every aspect of the candle, divide the container into equal sections, and mark off each spot that I need to add a wick to. 
I just wanna move a couple of these wicks over a tiny little bit. And if you make a mistake, you can always move the wick. Just pry the sticker off, scrape the residue away, add a new sticker, and reposition. Now that I'm happy with the way this looks, I'm removing the paper. The last thing I need to do before I pour the wax is secure the wicks so that they are standing up straight. If I were making a smaller candle, I'd be able to use a wick bar to center the wick. But because this is such a wide container, I'm going to have to get a little more creative here. Chopsticks are long enough to place across the container, and I'm also using hair clips to grab the wicks. The goal is to have the wick standing straight up so that it doesn't dry into the wax at an angle. I don't like putting the melting pitcher directly onto my source of heat, so first I add a pot, then I add my melting pitcher, and I also add a little bit of water before I turn on the heat. Add a thermometer so that you can track the temperature. I don't want this to go above 185 degrees Fahrenheit. After the wax is fully melted, add the fragrance oil. The temperature is about 180 degrees. After I add the fragrance oil, I remove the pitcher from the heat and stir it for about two to three minutes. My hand does get a little tired during this step, but it's worth it. I know that some people have um, melting pitchers that will automatically stir the candle for them. I have not invested in this yet, so I just have to put in the work. I'm not just doing this to mix the fragrance in, I'm also doing this because I'm waiting for the wax to cool down to about 165 before I pour. Pouring when the wax is too hot can lead to sinkholes and other issues with the finish of the candle. The slower a candle cools down, the better. After I finish pouring, I don't move or touch the candle until the next day. I'm trimming the wicks, but I'm not going to throw these away. There is plenty of wick left over, so I plan to retab these for future candles. I leave new candles to cure for at least seven days before I burn them. And I know it's hard to wait sometimes, but again, it's definitely worth it. You should always let your candles cure for at least one week, sometimes longer, depending on the wax type. This candle looks good, but the only way to know if it will burn properly is to test it out. The melt pool goes all the way to the edge of the container, so the candle will burn evenly all the way down without leaving any tunnels in the wax. 